Hello, my name is Nick Fothergill. Welcome to You're Not In The Forces Now. This debriefing session was part of the residential lifestyle program in Victoria. I hope at the end of the video you find the information in it of value to you, and I hope that it helps you move on to a much better life. Thank you for listening. The next um, session that we're going to look at uh, is called You're Not In The Forces Now, and I'll, I'll give you a bit of a a guide to where it came from. This has been part of the lifestyle course for about five years. And it actually arose out of some letters that I wrote when I was in Vietnam. And like many of us, what I thought the letters were about was about the weather and the food. One page long, last paragraph said, got to go on patrol now, or got to go on operations, or got to go on picket duty, or whatever, as an excuse to, to finish off because I didn't have anything to write about. I wrote about 32 letters, and my wife kept them all, and she numbered them in order. And in 1994, I started to read them. Now, I read them for, attempted to read them one weekend, and um, got a little bit distressed, so threatened to destroy them. She took them off me and told me to calm down, grow up, do all that sort of stuff, and then, um, when I was calm enough to read them again. So the following weekend, I, I reread the letters. And what I found was that I hadn't written about the food and the weather in the early stages. What I'd actually written about was what was happening inside my head as I was going through the, um, the pre-embarkation period, the trip over on the Sydney, and then the first operations and the various ones in until a letter that was about nine pages when a mate of mine was killed pretty well close to me. Now, that letter after that operation was um, nine pages long and was full of all the sorts of anger and hate and all that sort of stuff. After that, there were no more letters about what my thinking was about. From that point on, all the letters were about with the, what I could remember them. One page is on that little, you know, the little pad that had the map of Vietnam on it and the stuff. And that was basically all that was written. At the same time, I had only just finished as a, a tactics instructor in training command in the infantry. And I had been out of my psych training for about four years. So the combination of the letters, the recent experience as still as an instructor, and as uh, a psychologist, all came together in, into the session. The title of it, You're Not in the Force, and now came from the fact that every time I'd come back out of an exercise in the bush, my wife would always say to me, you're not in the army now. And she'd make me take off all my army gear and put it in a shed. And I was never allowed to bring it into the house. And uh, so I've just changed the title of it for that. What I want to explain to you is that where you may believe that, that Vietnam is the cause of so much of the trauma, what I want to start you to think about is that Vietnam was only the point where the trauma was reinforced. That a lot of the, the behaviours that you have and the, the sorts of stresses you exhibit now and the ways that you cope now really had more to do with your training than it ever did to do with Vietnam. That Vietnam simply was the icing on the cake that embedded it into your system. In order to do that, I need you to start to think about how we are trained. And I'll let Napoleon have the first say. A man does not have himself cured for a few halfpence a day. You must speak to the soul in order to electrify the man. And Napoleon was quite correct. In order to get us to fight, you have to speak to the soul. You've got to train inside. That humans are not creatures that necessarily go out and fight a war as part of our normal everyday life. So what we have to do is we have got to start to change the way you operate. And in order to change the way you operate, I need you to start to think about your first few days in the military. So let's go back. And we'll go back to the military. Before you went in, 30 guys arrive in the camp. Okay? They arrive in a bus. And what did they look like? Civilians. And a civilian haircut in those days was what? 
longer hair, okay? So the 30 guys in the bus were all different. They get off the bus at Kapuka or Pakapanyal. When you get off the bus, what happens? The littles are in front of everybody. Okay, yelled and screamed at. They then marched off to wherever, and then what happens? Tell me the next 24 hours, what happens in the next 24 hours? Haircut. So we all get a nice little trim and we can have the sideboards and that, or what happens? Everything over the top, all the same. Okay, what happens to your clothing, your civilian clothing? Put in a bag, bag is put away in the queue store, out of sight for weeks, and you are issued with? Everything, right down to your underwear. So, everything's done. You get assigned a number, you have a rank. And we'll talk army, what was the rank? What was the rank? Recruit. recruit. What's a private? Private's above a recruit. What's higher than a recruit in the army? Yeah, the CO's dog outranks a, a recruit, doesn't he? <laughs> so the recruit, lowest of the low. And over the next couple of days, you get to bed, lights out at 10 o'clock. They're on at 6 o'clock in the morning. So you get eight hours sleep, do you not? Oh, yeah? What happens in that eight hours that you're supposed to be sleeping? Yes, what else? Because you're not issued with sparkling, shining boots, are you? Okay, so in the, even in the eight hours that you're supposed to be sleeping, you're spending your time having to clean gear, to practice stuff, or whatever. So in the end, you get minimal hours of sleep. And when you wake up the next morning, how are you woken up out of your bed? Rudely. 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 What's another word for rudely in this thing? Passive or aggressive? aggressive. Very aggressive, isn't it? Okay. If you happen to lay in, then you are turfed out of your bed. And then your day starts. And how much rest do you get through that day? All right. So what are we doing to you? All right, you say brainwashing. Tell me what brainwashing is about. What are we brainwashing here? Okay, so what process are we conditioning? Go back to yesterday when, when Helga was talking about your stress responses. You need to learn a particular mechanism. What was that called? Can you remember what we called it? Fight and flight response. Okay, how many of you when young fellows went rabbiting? used to go spotlighting rabbits. Okay, so you go spotlighting rabbits. What happens when the rabbit's hit with the spotlight at night? Freezes. Freezes. So the rabbit, being confused with something that is totally out of the ordinary, such as blinding light in the middle of the night, freezes. A stress response, a normal stress response. What do we have as humans? When you're confronted with something that is totally out of the ordinary, that you do not expect, what would you normally do? What is our normal response? Before the panic, you do something. You stop dead, you freeze. Okay, now if that's normal, the normal human stress response, now if that's normal and we didn't do any training and I took you in a military situation, sent you to war with that response and at the first loud shot that rang out or whatever happened and you froze, what would happen? Bad investment, isn't it? If I'm going to send you into that environment and I allow you to have what is normal to the civilian world or the civilian person, then I'm going to invest thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 in equipping you and training you for you to be killed at the first sign of a, um, anything like a shot ringing out. So I have got to change the flight and fight. So how do I do it? And we say recruit training is approximately three months. What's one of the very first things you learn? when you're in the army, in the military? Drill. drill. What is the very first drill movement you learn? Standard Tension standard ease, which involves how many movements? That's one movement. To get you to do that, what do I do? Will you please stand at attention? Or would you stand at ease everybody? No, what do I do? I yell, I scream, the command aloud. You do that movement, that first simple drill movement. You do that by aggressive commands. And you do that movement over and over until you can do it how? 
without thinking. All right, so we've got without thought. What's another word for without thought and automatic? Instinctive. I then teach you to turn right and turn left. Several movements. Again, by how? We do it by numbers, we do it by repetition, we do it by loud commands. Until you can do it how? I then move it up to the about turn. Then when I've got you doing the stationary drill, then what do I get you to do? On the march. Now in between doing all this drill, I also teach you about the food, about rations and a bit about the weapons, some basic weapon stuff. And again with the weapon. How do I train you on the weapon? Repetitious, over and over and over again. Punishment if you don't do it right. If you do not perform your drill right, I punish you. If you persist in not performing it right, who do I punish? The platoon. And what does the platoon do after knock-off time to you? They sort out you. So I use not only the discipline, but I also use peer punishment for the ones that don't toe the line. If you don't toe the line, you're punished by your mates. And we build up this over and over again. We then go into that mode, all right, that automatic instinctive mode. So as soon as a command is yelled out, you will do what? Do it immediately. Okay. Now you do this very well. And at the end of this period, what happens? The end of your recruit training, what actually happens? You have a? You get a reward. What's one of the rewards you get? No, not yet. You get a march out parade, you get a small pay increase, and you get some leave before your next bit of training. This reward of the pass out parade, who is it in front of? What are they? What are civilians by now? In the scheme of things, you were way up here now. You've done your recruit training. And the civilians were way down there, even less than a recruit. So you have your pass out parade. And then you head off to core training. And again, that's about three months. Now, we'll go to infantry corps training as the most extreme form of training. But remember, all corps, all services still have to train to be able to fight. We did drill in the recruit training. Can anyone remember what happens in corps training? The infantry ones amongst us specifically, particularly in this case. What sort of training do you now do? What sort of drills are these called? Can you remember? Yeah, contact drills. <coughs> and if you remember, one of the very first things you learn is what's called the immediate action. Now, not the immediate action on the weapon, but the immediate action on the firing of a shot. Can any of you remember what the points are? Yes, but it had a sequence. Run, down, crawl, observe, aim, fire. So the minute a shot rings out, you run a few paces, you hit the ground, you move from where you hit the ground, you have a little look. If you can see where it comes from, you then return the fire. In the process of doing that, you then have to call out one of four things. Can you remember what the four contact drills are? Contact front? No, the contact left and right are called what? Ambush left, ambush right, contact rear. And the minute those things are called out, you go into a sequence of responses of what you have to do. How do I get you to do the contact drills? Here, I got you to do it by yelling at you. How do I get you to do it?